Welcome to the next video in our introductory chemistry topics video series. In this video, we are going to talk about chemical and physical properties. So first up, let's discuss physical and chemical, physical properties and physical changes. So a physical property is a characteristic of matter that is not associated with a change in the chemical composition. So some examples of this could be, say, density, color, melting point, boiling point, conductivity. So if we analyze the density of a substance or look at the color of that substance, we're obviously not changing the composition. If we're melting it or boiling it, we're again not changing that composition. And so a physical change is a change in which the state or properties of matter occurs with out a change in chemical composition. So examples could be boil, melting, for example. If we have an ice cube here, we've got solid water molecules up here in a nice, well-ordered lattice structure. And if that ice cube melts, you get water molecules once again, now in a more disordered liquid form. But the point is, is there is no change in that melting process in the underlying chemical identity of the compound in question. For example, water here. Same story with boiling. Moving from a liquid to a gas phase, it does not alter the chemical identity of the compound. Uh, dissolving. We talked about the example of a cup of tea in a, a previous lecture. So if you have a cup of tea, and let's say you put some sugar into that tea and you dissolve it. Dissolving that sugar into the tea does not alter the chemical identity of that sugar. It's sweet before you put it in there, it's sweet afterwards. And so if we want to identify a physical change, all we have to do is look at the identity of the compound both before and after the change has occurred and see whether or not there is a change in identity. So for example, if we look at dry ice, dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. So you have a bunch of these CO2 molecules all arranged in a nice ordered lattice structure. And it turns out a really cool property of dry ice is that it, if sitting at room temperature, these solid CO2 molecules will jump out right like this into the gas phase. So it's this movement directly from the solid to the gas, which is called sublimation, um, that carbon dioxide undergoes is in fact a physical change because before and after the change occurs, you still have the same chemical identity, namely carbon dioxide. Now, if we look at chemical properties and chemical changes, now we are looking at an alteration uh, in the chemical identity of the compound. So a chemical property describes the ability to change into another type of matter. So for example, chemical reactivity in general um, is gonna be a topic we're gonna be exploring a lot in this course. Um, the propensity for a certain compound to form a different array of other compounds, it's chemical reactivity, is a chemical property. Flammability, the corrosive nature of a compound, right? All of these involve a chemical change and are therefore chemical properties. And so a chemical change then is uh, defined as a change that produces one or more types of matter that differ from the matter present before the change. So the key word there is differ. You are getting a new kind of substance at the end of the day. So the examples could be, like illustrated here, burning uh, propane fuel in a little campfire burner. So if you've got a little camping burner here, you are changing these propane molecules, which is a bunch of carbon and hydrogen, and in the presence of oxygen into a bunch of water molecules and CO2 molecules. So notice here you have propane down here before you burn it, and afterwards you have compounds with a different chemical identity, therefore a chemical change has occurred. Another example could be, as we saw on our title slide here, the rusting of iron. 
So as iron rusts, there's actually oxygen atoms that insert themselves into the nice pretty lattice structure that you see in, you know, for example, brand new, uh, you know, iron nails. Um, and these oxygen atoms in red here, right, are a hallmark of an oxidation process that we call rusting. Obviously, we've changed the chemical identity going from just iron atoms to now iron with oxygen mixed in. And the result, of course, is uh, you know, apparent to the naked eye. You get this um, you know, you know, rusty appearance of the you know, browns and reds being introduced to that uh, nice shiny metal. So let's consider an example problem now. Let's suppose, um, you know, I, I, I can give you a handful of different processes, uh, many of which you might be familiar with, and I want you to classify each one of these processes as either a chemical or a physical change. So go ahead and pause the video for a second and try and answer each one of these, uh, and then we'll come back through here in a second and go through the answers. So first up, a, the evaporation of lamp oil. So the key word here is evaporation. We're not burning the lamp oil, it's simply moving into the gas phase. So you have lamp oil in the liquid phase moving into the gas phase. It has not been burnt, there's no chemical alteration. Therefore, uh, because it's an evaporation process, we are looking at a physical change. The burning of lamp oil, on the other hand, does involve altering the chemical composition of the substance. The oil is going to be turned into carbon dioxide and water and perhaps some other stuff. But the point is, you're going to be getting a change in chemical identity. Therefore, we have a chemical change. C, the bleaching of hair with hydrogen peroxide. So in this case, uh, we have to think about another hallmark feature of a chemical substance, namely its color. So if you look at a certain compound, that compound is going to interact with light in a certain way and give, bounce off certain waves of light and have a, a color that, are, that we perceive. If you change the identity, the chemical identity of that compound, then you create the opportunity for interacting with light in different ways and hence giving rise to a different color. Therefore, if you see a change in color as you do with the bleaching of hair, that implies there has been a chemical alteration. We've got a chemical change right there. The formation of frost on a cold night, however, is essentially taking water out of the atmosphere, uh, condensing it onto those leaves, onto whatever surface it happens to be, uh, you know, condensing on and freezing. But the water is still water. It's H2O molecules from the atmosphere, from the air, turning into solid H2O uh, molecules on whatever surface. So this will be an example of a physical change. Now that sums up the distinction between physical and chemical changes. There's just two other terms that I want to introduce that are used um, you know, rather extensively throughout uh, the, the chemistry course. Uh, the first is the idea of an extensive property. So an extensive property is a property that depends on the amount of matter present. For example, the mass. If we have little brass weights here, and we have a small weight, medium weight, and a large weight, the mass of these different weights obviously depends on how much copper you have. Similarly, the volume of these weights depend on the amount of matter present. So both of these are examples of extensive properties. And as we move through the course, we're gonna be talking about a variety of different properties, uh, both physical and chemical and we are going to be discussing whether or not they are extensive, whether or not they depend on the amount of matter present, or if they are intensive. Intensive properties do not depend on the amount of matter present. For example, temperature. If you have an ice bath 
and it's at zero degrees Celsius, whether you have a tiny little beaker or you make a huge bucket for an ice bath, that temperature of that ice bath at zero degrees is constant, right? So that temperature does not depend on how much you have. Similarly with color, whether you have a little bit of blue, uh, you know, copper crystals or a lot, um, it does not matter, the blue color remains. So let's do a quick sample problem on here to end out this mini lecture. Um, uh, comparing extensive and intensive properties, I want you to go ahead and take each one of these and classify these properties as either extensive or intensive, thinking about whether they depend on the amount, all right? So depend on the amount for extensive or they do not depend on the amount for intensive. Go ahead and pause the video, come up with some answers, and then we'll move through them shortly. Okay, so first up, boiling point. Does the boiling point of a substance depend on how much of that substance you have? Well, as long as you have a macroscopic quantity of this substance, whether it's a little cup of water or a big cup of water, the boiling point of that water does not change. Therefore, boiling point is going to be an intensive property. Similarly with the melting point, right? Does not matter how much you have, um, it will have the exact same properties. Now, odor. So odor is the result, our perception of odor is the result of molecules impacting olfactory receptors inside of our uh, you know, nasal cavity and us uh, translating that chemical interaction between the receptor and odorant molecule into some sort of uh, sensation. So the odor is a characteristic of that individual molecule that is impacting the receptor. So whether you have a little bit of those molecules or a lot of those molecules, you're gonna have a different intensity of the odor, but the odor itself will not change. So if it smells like a banana, uh, it'll smell like a banana whether you have a little bit or a lot of it, but the smell will just get stronger with increasing concentration. So we have another intensive property. Uh, extensive uh, will be the answer then for our final one, surface area. So the surface area obviously depends on how much of that stuff you have present. So again, it doesn't matter the type of material that we're talking about or the type of matter. If you uh, increase the surface area, then you must have increased um, the amount of that substance that you have. Now we're gonna be assuming there, of course, that uh, you know, we're not changing other properties along with it, for example, density um, and, and those sorts of things. So we'll be uh, uh, basically uh, classifying all the properties that we present throughout this course as either intensive or extensive, and it'll help guide our understanding of these different properties and understanding of the underlying behavior of these different substances.